Rory, why did you get involved in Meat Magic in the first place? Because I think it solves two beautiful problems, which is how to get businesses to give money to charity in large and significant amounts while making the decision entirely justifiable on the grounds of self-interest. And the second reason is that effectively it closes what I call this massive problem in B2B, which is the gap in the middle of the funnel, mm. which is in between what you might call generic marketing activity and the face-to-face -face meeting. There's this yawning gap which is missing where people ought to be out there exploring opportunities. But in many cases, if you're actually a large corporate purchaser, you practically hide because as soon as you put your head above the parapet, you get bombarded with irrelevant, irrelevant sales attempts. So the money that's given to charity acts as a worthwhile costly signal and filter. So the recipient of the pitch can be fairly confident that someone's at least done their homework and it's a worthwhile, relevant pitch, or they wouldn't be paying $1,000 or mm. more. Mm. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, so in other words, it seems to me to be one of those things, one of those rare business ideas which literally benefits all three participants. Mm. So it is literally, it's not only a win-win, it's actually a win-win-win if you include the charitable component. Mm. I've also, I've always had this belief that there should be a large category of the charitable economy should make its money. And I first had the idea years before I came across Meet Magic, which was that one or two parking spaces and a mm -hmm. street and maybe 10 parking spaces and a car park should be the same price, but with a charitable donation attached. Mm -hmm. The argument being that people who really, really need them can signal the willingness to pay without the car park being seen as profiteering. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Mm. And I think mm. there are lots and lots of opportunities for what you might call charitable yield management, if you like, where the business itself doesn't want to look completely venal and horrible, mm. but at the same time, you do need the price mechanism to distinguish who really needs this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've been obsessed with that for pretty much 10 years. And so when Meet Magic came along, I saw it as precisely an example of this. What would you, I mean, lots of charities out there find it really difficult to raise funds, especially small charities like mine, the yep. Rockefeller Foundation, from the godfather, grandfather, however they describe you. What would your advice be to a foundation like mine in terms of marketing to raise funds to do the work that we do? I don't know offhand. However, um, one interesting thing would be undoubtedly, I mean, Funnily enough, one of my obsessions is that uh, the most underestimated event of the last 10 years is not that video conferencing necessarily got technologically better, but that it, it simply became normalized. Mm. I think it's a hugely important development. And one of the things I recommend is that almost certainly every successful meeting you have, every successful donation you get will be preceded by some sort of video exchange this is what I mean by the middle of the funnel, and concentrate your efforts on doing that really, really well. Mm. And what about... I mean I, I mean, I literally mean this because it strikes me as strange mm. the extent to which the importance of this change. If you think about it, if we'd invented teleportation, there'd be lots and lots of people mm. discussing mm. what are the economic implications. Mm. And this is almost as important, particularly in, in a business setting, and nobody's talking about it. Trying to get people to recognise that people in prison are human yep. is a challenge. Um, and from a behaviourist point of view, how, how do you change that narrative? How do you market that argument that everyone deserves a second chance? There's a very strange thing about incarceration. So one of the things I'd look to behavioural science for is a thing called chunking, which is you take three things that people have always looked at um, uh, as one thing and you split them into three or two or five or whatever. It's a known behavioral technique. Now, it strikes me that incarceration serves at least three purposes. One of them is purely punitive, mm -hmm. okay? It's mm -hmm. purely to act as a disincentive mm -hmm. to people committing similar acts. The second one is rehabilitation, I suppose. And the third one is uh, literally protecting the public from the person who's incarcerated, okay? So there are at least three separate things, and yet we don't actually think of them separately. Mm. 
Mm. So there's something there. Do you see what I mean? You, mm. For some reason, the, the spell in prison is sort of expected to do all three. Mm. But actually treating those as separate strikes me as interesting. I also think, by the way, that this is something with very strong status quo bias, the whole idea of uh, imprisoning people, particularly for non-violent offences where the public are not endangered by this person. Okay. I think in a hundred years' time, we'll look back on the practice in the way we look back on beheading, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. in the, you know, in the 19th century, or the, you know, the way in which we looked at slavery, for example, mm -hmm. looking back with a hundred years mm -hmm. of benefit of hindsight. I think what we need to do is realise that this may be one behaviour, um, particularly at the levels practised in the US, but even so elsewhere, I think this is one of those cases where we need to look at this and go, look, one day we're going to find a way out of this and we're going to look back on this and think what, what a ridiculous way in which to treat people mm -hmm. and what, what an absurdly indiscriminate way, in many ways, in which to treat people. And I think once you get people to understand that it's one of those things where you, know, you can get extraordinary success in terms of changing the public mood on things. I don't think you'll change the public mood very quickly on the basic business of vengeance, okay, no. or, or the punitive component. Mm -hmm. But the other components, uh, the, particularly the question of rehabilitation, I, I don't think it's impossible to get, it'll take 10, 15 years, be realistic, okay, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. major attitudinal changes take at least that long. I don't think it's impossible to get a complete rethink. I don't think it's impossible to get a complete ep epiphany in the public. Mm, great. Thank you, Rory. Pleasure. Thank you.